Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge and J.C. Abbott. Today, we're discussing the Toronto Argonauts celebrating their Grey Cup victory with the Leafs, Raptors, and Drake. Ryan Dinwiddie giving Chad Kelly a vote of confidence. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders adding local QB Mason Nias to their negotiations list. Current Ticats QB Dane Evans posting a video of moving trucks outside of his Hamilton home. And the Laval Rouge d'Or winning their 11th Vanier Cup. But first. According to TSN's Farhan Lalji, the Blue Bombers have agreed to a three-year contract extension with head coach Mike O'Shea. How big of a move is that for Winnipeg? Well, I, I don't think it can be understated when it comes to the importance of the dynasty that the Bombers have built. Winning two great cups, coming one point away from forcing overtime in the third Uh, Mike O'Shea is the straw that stirs the Drake in Winnipeg. Yes. Zach Kolaris does great things on under center. Yes. You know, Brady Oliveira had a thousand yard season. Yes. Dalton Schoen led the league uh, in receiving as a rookie. Yes. The O-line is solid. Yes. On defense, you know, Willie J coming off the edge, commanding a bunch of attention, all that stuff. We all know about all that stuff. Uh, But Mike O'Shea, I think it's the primary reason why this team has been successful. I asked Kyle Walters point blank during great cup week, you know, trade for Zach sign, sign Adam big Hill, sign Willie J you've made, you know, shrewd moves as your time as the GM of this team is Michael Shea, the best move you've ever made unequivocally. He said, yes, absolutely. Um, He said, basically, as soon as I got the job, I knew Mike was the guy I wanted to hire as my head coach. And he's been fantastic the whole way through. I will say we've had some fans reach out and, and, and accuse not just our publication, but the media in general of making too much of the story. I vehemently disagree. When you've got a future Hall of Fame head coach, mind you, can you get inducted into the Hall of Fame twice? O'Shea's already in the Hall of Fame as a player. But, I mean, he deserves to go in as a coach at this point. Two-time reigning coach of the year. He's tied for 14th all-time in most head coaching wins. He's going to move up that list in 2023. He's almost he's only got two guys to beat in Winnipeg. He's the third winning as coach in Blue Bombers history behind the legendary uh, Cal Murphy and, of course, the legendary Bud Grant. Um, so, anyways, this cannot be understated. The thing I'm curious about, boys, is, is the last two times O'Shea has agreed to contract extensions after his previous contract had expired in 2016 and 2019, General Manager Kyle Walters had extensions announced at the same time. Walters is signed only through 2023. I'm curious to see if he will also ink another extension with the club heading in to the next season. Yeah, that's certainly a storyline to watch going forward with Walters. But on O'Shea, this is a guy... You know, as a as a minor football coach, a guy who coaches high school, there are few pro football coaches that I have more respect for uh, than Mike O'Shea and and what he does and the way he's established that culture in Winnipeg. Just watching him from afar, you want to play for that guy. You want to run through a wall for him. You know, it's often said in hyperbole around coaches. I think for him, it's real. Sometimes he could be a little bit frustrating because he's not always uh, on the media side as as giving as maybe some other more personable head coaches. But that's what his players love about him. He is beloved in that locker room because of how he protects them, because of how he empowers them to be leaguers because of the way he trusts them. And that's a unique thing. And it's a unique thing for a team that's had success for a number of seasons. Oftentimes you'll see sort of a meteoric rise from a coach and and they can get too big of a head or they try and implement too much. Mike O'Shea has really found the formula for success, which is his players. And he's stuck to it and he's done it with incredible humility Uh, I truly, my biggest takeaway from this past Great Cup week came during the team arrivals. And I think this is a window into uh, Mike O'Shea. We're sitting, first of all, he comes off the tarmac and he's the first guy into the the airplane hangar where all these interviews are happening. And like a dad, he immediately starts walking around checking out the airplane engines, which I thought was fantastic. But then, as the uh, as the other teams are uh, are 
are doing their press conferences. Um, one of the questions that was asked was earlier in the day when McLeod Bethel Thompson showed up, someone asked about his brief stint uh, in training camp with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers before he ever became a Toronto Argo. And he spoke very highly of Mike O'Shea. So they asked some of the other Bombers players about it. And the question was, was framed in a way that was glowing towards Mike O'Shea. And I had a direct sight line to him across the media press conference. And I watched his face crinkle up with disgust as someone complimenting him. And then he had to turn around and walk away because he simply couldn't handle those compliments uh, sent in his direction. And I think that really indicates the personality of the man and why he's been so successful in Winnipeg. I'm telling you, these Guelph guys, and by that I mean Griffin graduates, are cut from the same cloth. I have this saying that I tell myself all the time. Compliments create complacency, and I'm sure that's what O'Shea felt in that moment. And he hates hearing about it because he's so focused on the present and what's right in front of him. And it's cliche with this Winnipeg team and across sports now, but the Bombers are truly focused each and every single week on going 1-0. He does a great job of keeping that focus, not only himself, but for the rest of the organization and specifically the players. I think that's why they've been so successful over the last few seasons, especially winning back-to-back great cups and then coming not just one point away from going to overtime, Mr. Hodge, but a Robbie Smith field goal block on Mark Leggio from winning a third consecutive great cup. Now, I don't quite think they're a dynasty. I think to get to that point, you need to win three out of four. And I think that's why we're seeing Willie Jefferson and Adam Big Hill re-sign. Zach Caleros did that during the season. And of course, O'Shea, who reaffirmed his commitment at Great Cup. So this extension is really no surprise. But the critical aspect to me here is, does O'Shea get more power in the front office, being a two-time reigning coach of the year? And there are some guys in that front office that I think he would like to have more of a say. So we'll see exactly what happens in this situation with O'Shea and if any pieces move around or get more say in the front office. And something I think that we don't talk about enough is the fact that Winnipeg and JC, you kind of touched on this. Winnipeg has gotten better every year that, that, that O'Shea has been there. He's now been there for nine years, eight seasons, It's pretty common in pro sports for a coach to come in and have an immediate impact. And then by year three or four, the team is worse than when the coach got there. I'm not going to name any names, but if you look at some people who have been at coaches in this league, they have immediate success and they can't sustain it whatsoever, either because the people around them grow to hate that person or because they are a one trick pony who only knows how to do one thing. Mike O'Shea's record speaks for itself. He's in year, just just had the eighth season with this team, and they won 15 games. They've gotten better every single year. They weren't very good year one, year two, but man, they have they have steadily improved, and obviously that hard work has paid off. By the way, Dunk, I disagree. I think they already are a dynasty, partly because let's also face it, and we do have a lot of other pod to get to. I don't want to dwell on this point too long. This is a team that won dominated this league at a time when it was literally so hard to keep free agents that the league and the PA stepped up to limit the amount of player transiency, right? Edmonton won five in a row back in the late seventies, early eighties. That was a hot topic at great cup week because of course the bombers were looking to become the first three Pete in 40 years. Edmonton played at a time when free agency wasn't really a thing. Guys leaving for the NFL wasn't really a thing. When you look at the number of guys that Winnipeg has lost to the NFL over the last few years, how many guys had the opportunity to go elsewhere? Some of them did, right? They lost Kenny Lawler. They've lost some high price free agents, Andrew Harris, whatever. I think that given the context of when Winnipeg achieved this, I do think that they are they should be considered a dynasty, even if they fall flat next year. Um, obviously that remains to be seen, but I think they are a dynasty. I do. We won't get into some of the stuff that might be helping keep these players in Winnipeg. Okay. But I can understand where you're coming from. They have been a very good team for a while now under O'Shea. I just think if we're going to start talking dynasty, they need to get that third one really good, difficult to go back to back, but let's see if O'Shea can make it three and four. And I think one of the things that stands out to me about O'Shea going back to great cup week not quite the same story to JC, but a little bit behind the scenes is 
the Blue Bombers practiced at Libel Field, which is a minor football field in Regina. And the main reason for doing so was because the Bombers staff had scouted it out. They didn't want anybody from, let's say, the Argos peeking in there to see what they were doing. And I think it's those type of details that O'Shea is the head man for that really makes this team just that much little bit better, which is what you need in professional football to consistently win double digit regular season games and be at the top of the West division. So it's small things like that, that set the bombers apart from the rest of the CFL. Yes and no. And, and by the way, the, the whole secrecy thing, I think is the one drawback of the bombers <laughs> achieving so much success. Cause that's going to, you know, we're, we're in a copycat league, a copycat world. Other teams are going to be closing walkthroughs, which is not allowed, by the way, under CFL rules, as far as I'm concerned, um, to try to protect the fact that, oh, look, their players are kind of sort of standing around on the field. <laughs> by the way, after watching all the walkthroughs at Grey Cup Week, I, I am on a personal mission. Walkthroughs are a terrible name. From now on, we are calling them stand arounds. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are not walkthroughs. These are standarounds. Let's get it right. Um, and anyways, we should move on. I will say one more thing. I saw criticism again, not just of our publication, the media in general, of, of making this a big story. Whatever. I'm sorry. It is our job to ask critical questions. Mike O'Shea might be the only coach in professional sports who would prefer to go into a year without a contract rather than signing an extension. And as the members of the media, it is our job to look at things that look like a duck and sound like a duck and quack like a duck and say, oh, look, folks, I, I, I'm being skeptical. I think that might be a duck. Mike O'Shea is just that one in a million who is, in fact, a squirrel. Looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, <laughs> is not a duck. Actually wanted to stay in Winnipeg. Anyways, let's move on, boys. The Vanier Cup drew a TV audience of 158,000 on CBC, which was almost 5% increase from 2021. The Laval Rouge Or defeated the Saskatchewan Huskies by a score of 30-24, thwarting a fourth-quarter comeback attempt by the Canada West champions. Dunk, what were your takeaways from the game? Well, going into the game, there was some controversy, let's say, because a lot of people out West felt like Saskatchewan Huskies quarterback Mason Nias should have been the Heck Crichton Award winner. Meanwhile, it was Laval receiver Kevin Mattel, who had an outstanding year, 12 touchdowns in the regular season, three more in the Dunsmore Cup to help get the Rouge or ultimately to the Vanier Cup, who took home the most prestigious individual award in Canadian University football. So you look at the game overall, I felt like Nice played very well. I'm sure there's going to be some debate on this podcast about that. Mattel was the MVP of the game, eight catches for 142 yards and also threw a touchdown pass, which ended up being the game-winning TD. So I think Mattel showed that he is above Nias. I do understand there's an argument there for Nias, but Mattel is to use a cliche, even though I hate him, a man among boys. He is a different type of dude. He's got an attitude. He'll trash talk. He'll tell you how good he is, and then he'll go out on the field and more than back it up. So the week got started with this decision that could have been close, but I think the right call was made because if we're going to give it, and I think this is how the award should be, to the best player each year in Canadian University football and not have it be a career award like we've seen in the past, then Mattel, for my money, was full value to win the Heck Crichton Award and also be the MVP of what was a spectacular display of Canadian University football. I completely agree with you, Dunk. That I mean, these two players were the storyline, not just – of this week and of this Vangie Cup game, but of the entire U Sports seasons because of how well they play. And I don't think you could go wrong with either choice, but I was pleasantly surprised to see Kevin Mattel take home the Heck Crichton trophy. I, like many other people, had simply assumed it was going to go to Mason Nyus because he's a quarterback and because he has that fifth year career achievement uh, thing that going for him, which has often resulted in a Heck Crichton trophy for guys who maybe haven't been as deserving as other candidates. But this time around, they got it right. And, and here's for those dissenting voices in Saskatchewan. And I know there is a lot of them. 
here's my argument as to why you give the heck Crichton to Kevin Mattel. If you are handing out an award for the most valuable player, based on the importance of the quarterback position, that is always going to go to the best quarterback, and that's Mason Nias. But just like in the CFL, the definition for the Heck Crichton Trophy is not most valuable like we see down in the States. It's most outstanding. And I think Kevin Mattel fits that definition because, well, Mason Nias had a season uh, of excellence. He showed himself to be the best quarterback in the country. And quite frankly, I think he was robbed of first team all Canadian status, which is another thing entirely. But he wasn't so far above and beyond what we've seen before at the U sports level that he separated himself from, uh, you know, the historical list of quarterbacks. He was exceptional, but he was traditionally except exceptional. Kevin Mattel is entirely different from players we've seen before. He, the numbers he was able to put up in terms of touchdowns were remarkable. And he did so on, on an offense that has traditionally not been that potent through the air. And, and Arnaud Desjardins had a very good season at quarterback for Laval. He was extremely accurate. But you look at the chunk of the yardage and the, the points that Kevin Mattel was able to put up. He was their entire offense for long stretches of the season. He dominated the RSCQ, and then he did the same thing on the national stage. So I'm sure Hodge will want to dive into the, the game itself a little bit more, but I think they got it right on the trophy end. Before Hodge gets into the game here, I think exactly what you said is bang on, JC. And I would argue that Mattel was the MVP, even if you look at that compared to Nias and his team. Yes, He's the quarterback for the Huskies, but you take Mattel away from that Laval offense, you know, especially in the Vanier Cup, he really infused some energy into Laval that was lacking with that catch on the sideline over Charlie Ringland. He was covered, but Desjardins knows if he puts it anywhere in the area code of Mattel, he's going to go up and get it. He made an NFL, CFL style catch going up and over a defender, keeping a foot in bounds for that grab that was sensational to really get Laval going in that game, who had a slow start. And to the numbers, Arnaud Desjardins, great quarterback, very accurate, young in his second year, still developing, had a wonderful season. He threw 20 touchdown passes to lead U Sports. 12 of those went to Mattel. All three of his touchdown passes in the Dunsmore Cup went to Mattel. It was Mattel who threw a touchdown in the Vanier Cup, not Desjardins. Now, Desjardins maybe didn't have as many opportunities in the Vanier Cup as he had in other games to throw touchdowns, but just those sheer numbers show you that Mattel was the most outstanding player, was the most valuable player on any team in U Sports football. And I'm saying that as a guy that's usually a Canada West truther from doing all the games out there in that conference throughout the regular season. And of course the Hardy cup, I've seen Mason Nias develop. He is a wonderful quarterback. He has helped turn that Huskies offense into a pass first offense during his time there when it used to be run first with a bunch of great running backs going through there, Tyler Chow, and then Adam Mackard, it was supposed to be Josh Iwanchina this year, but he got hurt early in the season. So a young guy in Riker Frank took over, but it didn't necessarily matter who was running the rock because Nias threw the ball so well to a group of young receivers. You know, I wonder, and this is something that's going to be a total projection, but if you put Kevin Mattel and Mason Nias on the same team, let's say Nias played for Laval or Mattel played for Saskatchewan, what would their collective numbers be in that instance? To me, that would be the real separator. And I completely agree with you, JC. I thought Nice should have been the first team All-Canadian quarterback. All due respect to Desjardins, he should have taken the second team nod. But Nice should have been the first team All-Canadian. And imagine those two guys on the same field together. Maybe down the line, that'll happen in the pros. Just so our, our listeners know, uh, 12 minutes after the segment started, Mason <laughs> Nias threw for 2,773 yards in the regular season, along with 18 touchdowns and three interceptions. Kevin Mattel 
58 catches for 751 yards and 12 touchdowns. That means Mason I has only threw for six more touchdowns than Mattel scored all season. I will also note that eight of Nias's touchdown passes came against the Calgary Dinos this year who were objectively terrible. So I'm not taking anything away from Nias. I agree. He should have been all Canadian. I think that Kevin Mattel was the right pick as the heck Crichton winner. But I'm surprised JC agrees with me because you know who I thought JC was going to bang the table for Nathan Rourke. <laughs> Most don't stand. Come on. Come on. I had to listen to you bang the table for Nathan Rourke for two months. I'm surprised you didn't want him to win this award as well. It doesn't matter that he didn't play news sports, guys. He was so outstanding. So outstanding. <laughs> but yes, the game was great, boys. Um, and the Huskies damn near took it at the end. Um you know, the Nias did have a pick in that game, came off a receiver's hands. Ball probably should have been caught. And if the ball is caught, the Huskies may very well win that game. And by the way, a full testament to the Vanier Cup and the Grey Cup this year. The Grey Cup, I don't think, was as well played as the Vanier Cup. But you couldn't ask for two better finishes for Canadian football fans who took in both games. Yeah, this was a fantastic contest in the Vanier Cup from start to finish. Heck, everything you want from this game, momentum swings, you know, uh, both teams in it right until the very end. It was one of the best football games that I've had the pleasure of watching uh, this season. And and if you're the type of person who loves the CFL uh, but doesn't carve out a little time in the year to watch some U sports football, go down to your local school, watch those guys play, or, or at least tune in for the Vanier cup and the national semifinals. You really are missing out because there is some fantastic, fantastic football being played by guys who are going to be stars at the professional level. And you can get it for, Dirt cheap. You can go down. You can probably pay 10 bucks to get into your local stadium and watch this football. You tune in to the CBC and watch this broadcast. It, it's well worth your time uh, because of the quality that is on display on the field. The quality is really high and it's been rising for a number of years. And I can speak to the Canada West Conference particularly because I see so many of those games live. So if you, even if you don't want to go out and you know pay your money to watch the game live, if you're in Manitoba, turn on Bell MTS. If you're in Saskatchewan, turn on SaskTel. If you're in Alberta or BC, turn on TELUS and watch these Canada West football games. It's a wonderful production that Bamboo Shoots puts on largely through SaskTel. They follow the Rams and the Huskies around most of the time. And these athletes out there are so competitive and really week to week, even though Calgary, as Hodge noted, had an off season, there were still some competitive games there with teams at the top of the conference. You don't know who's going to win week to week. It's not like when Western lines up against York and you know Western's going to literally run them out of the building. The Canada West Conference, I think, is the most competitive top to bottom. Surely the OUA, that top tier there, can be competitive from year to year. But you look at the Yates Cup this year – and the Mustangs ran over the Queens Gales, who had only had one loss on the season. And that was against Western. Usually, in Quebec, it comes down to a battle between Laval and Montreal. And we should give some credit to the Atlantic University Sport Conference because I feel like the last number of seasons, a lot of people throw some shade their way. And the St. FX X Men. A lot of people? You mean you, Dunk? Well, <laughs> yes, I didn't want to necessarily name myself, but fair, you outed me. <laughs> Come on. You can't you can't you can't play core like that. You wear yeah, it. I, wear I, I, it. I believe I believe what you said earlier this season is that no AUS team should ever be considered for the top ten ever. I believe that was your quote. <laughs> well, this year. And the St. FX X Men proved me wrong. They battled Saskatchewan. Yes, the Huskies had to go all the way out to the East Coast, and I think they kind of just thought they were going to show and win. They ultimately did to get to the Vanier Cup, but credit the X-Men for showing that the AUS can at least be competitive with these teams. So there's a bunch of great football players out there, and you can see the next stars. Like Kevin Mattel was an absolute treat to watch in the Vanier Cup, and I think he's a guy that 
could either, and people might not want to hear this, but enter the transfer portal and go down to a big time NCAA school or possibly get NFL looks. Certainly he's going to get looks from CFL teams when he's eligible, but I think he's a dude that just stands far and above the rest. We'll have to see how fast he runs a 40 because that's such a metric for the NFL teams. But there's these type of guys every year that are playing in Canadian University football. And usually there's a guy or two, sometimes there's a handful, that will get looks from NFL teams. Theo Benedet, an outstanding offensive lineman with the University of British Columbia, has already had at least half a dozen NFL teams call about him, ask for game film, and do the tape study. So more and more we're seeing these athletes get shots and looks from the NFL, a bunch of them, as we know, usually well over half of the CFL draft picks come from U sports football. And it's a great level. And I think the Vanier cup accentuated that point and really showed that when these guys are playing at their best, that it is quality and highly entertaining football. Well, Dunk, you also reported that Mason Nias has been added to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders neg list, so he's another guy who could potentially be playing pro ball in 2023. And this is a great move, I think, for Saskatchewan in terms of a PR standpoint because they're coming off such a terrible season and not even making the playoffs in a great cup year. And Nias was actually born in Regina, went up to Saskatoon to have a spectacular career with the Saskatchewan Huskies. And he just passed me on the all-time passing list. And as these years go along and these quarterbacks get better, I get bumped further and further down the list. So shout out to Mr. Nice for passing me on the all-time passing yards list in U Sports. And I'm hoping that he gets a legitimate shot with the Riders. Some people might look at him and say, well, he's not athletic enough and he can't move outside the pocket and he's not going to scramble for first downs. But this guy studies really hard. He is a student of the game. He has played three down football his entire life. I believe he's got the arm strength to make all the throws. And if you put him in a professional atmosphere, and he's been there before, he's been through the Canadian quarterback internship program with the Rough Riders. I think he could thrive in that environment. And I see no reason why he doesn't at least deserve the same opportunity that a bunch of Americans get come up north of the border who have never played this Canadian game to compete legitimately for a roster spot with the Rough Riders. And we all know that Saskatchewan could use a quarterback of the future, fellas. They certainly could. And and let's not get carried away. Mason Nias is not going to jump in and immediately be the starting quarterback for your Saskatchewan Rough Riders. But to your point, Justin, this is one of many guys, I think, that that have come through the U-Sports Uh, ranks in recent years who have all the tools to be a guy on a CFL roster to compete for a spot, maybe not as your starter, but as your third stringer, as your second stringer, a guy who's just as talented as many of the people who get brought into training camp from south of the border and stick around on a practice roster and, and never become anything. Mason Nyos has taken tremendous strides as a passer the last two years. I was lukewarm on him coming into the draft in 2021. It should be noted he's on the Raggers neg list because he went undrafted last season. No CFL team wanted to take a shot on him. But I, I think everyone sort of missed a little bit on their evaluation, including myself, because with an increased role this season, he showed incredible poise and decision making and accuracy as a quarterback in that tough Canada West conference. Now, I didn't think the Vanier Cup was necessarily the best game he's ever played. I, I, I know you're going to disagree with me there, Dunk, <laughs> but he certainly has the tools going forward to be successful, to be a guy who can come in and not embarrass himself at the CFL level, who can pinch hit for you if you need him to. And I hope this is a trend that we see more of because teams sort of took notice of Canadian quarterback talent this past year with my boy Nathan Rourke having so much success and Trey Ford becoming the first quarterback since 1980 to get drafted in the first round and then coming in and becoming the first U sports quarterback to start and win a CFL regular season game since 1985. So now there's precedent for it. And I think teams are looking around at a depleted talent pool 
They're struggling to find quarterbacks who are up to that level, and they may start looking to U Sports more and more as that level of competition rises. And they realize, well, maybe there is an advantage to having a guy who can play our game, our three down game, and make those reads at a high level already and bring them on to the back end of our roster. Todd, I thought you were going to have a point here about Mr. Nias and Canadian quarterbacks, man. Don't we all love Canadian quarterbacks? No, we've been talking about U Sports for 20 minutes. Let's let's move on. <laughs> we just talked about a CFL connection for U Sports. The rough time, buddy. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> All right. QB Dane Evans posted on Instagram, moving trucks at his home in Hamilton. Do you think that's a sign he's played his last game as a member of the Ticats? I'm not sure the Instagram video has anything to do with it. I think maybe the acquisition of Boley by Mitchell has something to do with it. <laughs> I mean, look, like, like we know that his wife is from Oklahoma. He played his college football at Tulsa. Um, we know that he and his young family, they have a child now live in Hamilton full time or at least did um and and the size of the moving trucks would indicate that this was not a weekend trip to mom and dad's place to go visit grandma and grandpa uh we don't know anything beyond that Dane Evans uh, to my understanding has turned down interviews since the Bolivar Levi Mitchell trade was made um so this is mostly speculatory but i mean i said it on the podcast last week i think he's played his last game as a member of the Hamilton Tiger Cats because regardless of whether or not the Ticats are able to sign Bully by Mitchell to an extension, it's worth noting he's still slated to become a free agent in February. Dane Evans is supposed to make a boatload of money this year, over $450,000. It's a raise from what he made. Pardon me, when I say this year, I mean 2023. It's a raise from what he made this past season in 2022. And there's no way the Ticats are willing to pay him that. So either he has to take a massive pay cut to be a backup to a, a guy that that is going to the Hall of Fame, or he's got to take a pay cut and be a starter because Hamilton wasn't able to sign the guy they they obviously really wanted when they traded for Bolivar Mitchell. I don't see either of those scenarios playing out. I think he needs a fresh start and he needs to play. And this is just my opinion. I think he needs to play at least for a little while for a market that is not a hotbed. I've seen people speculate, oh, we could go to Saskatchewan. I'm sorry, Saskatchewan would be the worst imaginable fit for Dane Evans right now. He is not able to, or at least this past season, was not able to live up to expectations as the number one quarterback in Steeltown. If Ty Cats fans ate him alive, imagine what Riders fans could do. Uh, this is a guy who needs to go to a destination like Toronto. I could see him as a backup or a 1B option. In, in Ottawa, right, where he had a very good relationship with Jeremiah Masoli previously in Hamilton, or even a 1B scenario in a place like Montreal or BC, depending on what is going on with Nathan Rourke. I think those are all good fits. Keep him out of the prairies. He needs at least one year, it would seem, to win his confidence back. And by the way, I'll also add this. For those who thought that the post was clickbaity, I mean, first of all, we had it, like in the article we had at our site, you're entitled to your opinion, but also Dane Evans damn well knows what he's doing, or at least he should know what he's doing by posting something like this on social media. Not everything has to be on Instagram, and that's especially true if you're a professional athlete, if you're a, po a pub, uh, politician, if you work in the public sector, right? If you're a teacher, if you're a nurse, there's, there's lots of things, a doctor, there's lots of things you can't post on Instagram. He was the one who chose to post this on Instagram. I don't think it's our fault for 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 because he's got a lot of instagram followers with a peace sign to put the peace yes. sign on it in this day and age for the uninitiated the kids will tell you that means peace out man that means i'm leaving for good now this is speculatory again but i think hodge laid it out very well yeah those who have issue with it being clickbait first of all there was no uh, deception in the headline. You knew exactly what you were reading here, and you clicked on it because we know this was our second most read article of this past week because people are interested in what is going to happen at the quarterback position in Hamilton going forward. Now, I understand a lot of American players go back home uh, in the offseason. This is 
not uncommon. But in the past, Dang Evans has talked about wanting to put down roots in Hamilton. He stayed in the for stretches of the offseason before. And to me, uh, coming a, a six months re- rental does not. Re- require uh, two U-Hauls and two cars to vacate, right? That's a lot of stuff that he was moving there. That's a lot to take back and forth if you're coming back and forth every half a year. So this seemed like a more permanent transition, at least in my mind. And what was even more interesting to me than the post itself was I had to look at Dane Evans's Instagram page, and I, I'm not a follower. I don't uh, live and breathe on ev- every uh, meal that Dane Evans has or every picture he posts. So I can't say if this was a change from before, but I found it very interesting that in his bio on Instagram, it says pro quarterback. It does not say a team. There is no mention of the Hamilton Tiger Cats in his bio on Instagram. Dun, dun, dun. And the drama builds and it shows more and more fellas that the words coming out of Orlando Steinauer's mouth after the trade was made were absolutely bogus. Okay. He likes to say things and I hope he hears this and starts to understand now that this actually has had ramifications with Dane Evans, who it should be said was the quarterback that he chose to keep over Jeremiah Masoli. So that first and foremost needs to be said that, you know, sometimes, and this is why we need independent media outlets who tell the truth, that you need to look between these things up and around and underneath and see if they pass the smell test or what Hodge was saying earlier. Sometimes you got to ask if a duck is actually a squirrel. So these things have to be investigated. We're going to give you the truth. Now, this is largely speculation, but clearly, Dane Evans is feeling some type of way about the Tiger Cats trading for the rights to Bo Levi Mitchell. Just the rights right now. They still have to woo him and sign him. And Mitchell is going to fly out to Hamilton with his family and hear what the Tiger Cats have to say. But if you just look at the landscape of quarterbacks and the possible teams where Bo Levi Mitchell could sign this offseason, to me, there's only actually a couple that make sense, okay? You do not want to upset Chad Kelly if you're the Toronto Argonauts. Ryan Dinwiddie has said he believes he's a quarterback of the future. He sees him as a CFL starter. And it should be said Dinwiddie was integral in the move to acquire his rights from Edmonton. He really believed in Kelly's skill set. So, yes, Bo Levi Mitchell could go to Toronto. But that means if you're the Argos, you're going to have to pony up a bunch of cash and you might risk upsetting Kelly, similar to what the Ticats have done with Mr. Evans. Let's look at the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. That offensive line, absolutely atrocious. Might as well be a bunch of turnstiles out there. Just ask Cody Fajardo and his banged up knee and the rest of his body. So I can't see Mitchell signing there unless there's an absolute overhaul or they way over Pam. The team that I think needs to be talked about a little bit more, and they're used to making savvy moves at least – the last year or so and proving that they can compete in the West is the BC Lions. Yes, that's me making an assumption that Nathan Rourke is going to take a shot at the NFL, but I think it would be an ideal situation. You could have the salary cap money to sign Bully by Mitchell because Vernon Adams Jr. is right now on a contract that essentially makes him a backup. And then if Rourke happens to come back from the NFL in, let's say, a year, hopefully – for me, at least, he's down there for a very long time and gets a, st- a short to s- shot to start in the NFL because I think he's that good. Don't you think Mr. Mitchell would love to play in a dome out on the West Coast and be closer to Calgary where he has made a home and set down roots? I don't think that's being talked about enough. That's a bunch of speculation. But if you just look at the scenarios, fellas, I'm curious where you think about Mitchell landing at this point in time. I'll 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 go. I'll let JC touch on Bo. I I want to add one more thing about Dane Evans. Again, Dane has not done interviews since the Bully by Mitchell trade. His last post on Instagram culminated. You can go look at it for yourself. The last paragraph culminated with the paragraph: "Write me off, count me out, 
do whatever you want, but I know who I am as a man, teammate, and QB, and I know how sweet it's going to feel raising that great cop in Hamilton next year. The photo is him in a tie Cats jersey. He signs off as DE9 with a tie Cats emoji and a black heart and a yellow heart. Boys, this was posted six days before the Bully by Mitchell trade. So Dane has not taken control of his own narrative and spoken to the trade, and that is his right, but when you don't speak to it, you open the door for speculation. So that's why we are going to uh, be discussing that today. That's that's so anyways, that's my point. And by the way, I don't know what his Twitter or his Instagram bio said before, but currently his photo on his Instagram bio is not him in a tie cats jersey. It's him wearing a white T-shirt. So obviously he he is I would assume has moved some tie cat stuff from his, his Instagram account. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing his feelings when he wants to go on the record regarding the trade and his next steps as a quarterback is three weeks ago. He looked all in on Hamilton. I would assume it's not the case anymore. Yeah, just before we move on, because I know Hodge is looking at his watch <laughs> anxiously. <laughs> uh, to your point, Dunk, I think. Bo Levi Mitchell ending up in BC would be a fantastic fit. And quite frankly, I would pound the table for that move. I, I look at how he looked at the end of that West semifinal, uh, throwing in that dome at BC place with some velocity. I think it's a, a perfect scenario for him. Everyone knows I'm not necessarily a believer in Vernon Adams Jr. <laughs> so I, I would like some competition <laughs> In there, and I think Bo Levi Mitchell out in Vancouver would be a great fit for him. By the way, stats that feel wrong but are correct. Dane Evans, quarterback rating in 2022, 90.2. Bo Levi Mitchell, quarterback rating in 2022, 87.2. Dane Evans, three points better, had a longer average attempt had more yards per game. His completion percentage was five points higher Threw for seven more touchdowns. The issue is he threw for 10 more picks, but all I'm saying is Dane Evans QB rating better than bully by Mitchell's in 2022, which is wild. Those numbers don't make sense to me when you consider that he threw for 10 more picks. They also don't take into account the fumble issues that Evans had. And the bigger issue to me is they don't take into account Oliver Mitchell being a two-time CFL MLP and Oliver Mitchell being a two-time great cup champion. (laughs) What's that? I said it's called a quarterback rating, not a fumble rating, but I get get where you're coming from. (laughs) It should all go into play. I just think that it's an interesting metric sometimes, but it doesn't tell the entire story. But this is something we're obviously going to monitor on the site on 3downnation.com and to the points you guys made earlier about clickbait, everything on the internet these days is designed to try to get you to click on it. I don't care if it's an ad, a story, a video, or anything else. That's what the internet is there for, okay? So you make that decision on your own. We largely present the facts, and that's what we did with this story very well on the site. JC, you said it. The headline told you. What was going down? All right. The rest of this conversation on the podcast, we have tabbed as being speculation. When we get facts, they'll be up on the site. Well, we always have facts on the site. And when we have analysis or opinion, it is clearly labeled as such. Right. So, yes, if it, and yes, your your click is a vote. Um and by the way, anytime people accuse us of clickbait, I say, well, look at the site right now. Look at the 10 most recent articles. Can you tell me which one is clickbait? Because um, Calgary Stampeders sign random defensive back is it's not clickbait, but whatever. It's fine. <laughs> the Edmonton Elks released global offensive lineman Steven Nielsen after he signed a contract with the Raiders to roll of the European League of Football. What does this mean for the league's global program? Well, it. It's certainly not a good look, and this has been a persistent problem. Well, let's not get into the merits of the global program here from from the CFL's perspective because I think the last thing that Hodge wants after a 20-minute discussion on U Sports is a 30-minute discussion on the merits of the global program. Correction, our listeners. (laughs) Dude, this has been a great podcast so far. I don't care what Hodge says. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. 
anybody listening who wants to give feedback, tweet at Justin and myself and tell us if you want more 20 minute discussions about U sports or if you want less 20 minute clock. <laughs> but it was warranted. We're talking about a player who had an all time great season in Kevin Mattel, Mason Nyes, who was added to the negotiation list for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and an outstanding game. We don't do it all the time, but this pod has been straight fire, boys. Keep it going. Okay, well, pe- pivoting people, back to let, the kid the from people. Austria. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I am nothing if not a, a, an advocate for democracy. So send us a thumb. It could even just be a thumb up emoji or a thumb down. Set so at John D. Hodge, at J Dunk 12. And then an emoji. Describe describe your take on this this week's podcast. There you go. I invite the feedback. Moving back to the global program so we don't get entirely off the rails this here. This has been too long on the global program, by the way, okay? <laughs> we are 30 <laughs> seconds into it. <laughs> Give us a break. Uh, not, not a good look, right? And this is not the first player who has done this, this movie. We should – Provide some context. The the Elks released uh, Stephen Nielsen. Uh, I'm blanking on the day, but just a couple days ago. But it was a, a week after he announced he had signed in the European League of Football with the Tyrol Ragers, uh, which, quite frankly, I'm a little bit jealous of him because uh, the Tyrol Ragers play in one of the most beautiful stadiums I have ever seen. It's a fantastic facility. Sort of looks like a... a a small college facility in the States, but it's, it's nestled right in the Alps. So it has a spectacular view. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. But Nielsen making that decision to step away to no longer wish to play in the CFL and instead go back to Europe has been a consistent problem. We saw this happen last year with Nicholas Gustav, who is the BC Lions uh, global player. He decided to leave actually for the same team, the Toro Ragers, uh, last off season without warning. It, it left the BC Lions in a bit of a bind for their global players. Uh, we've seen a number of guys at a practice squad level request their release and and, and leave as well. I, uh, David Azinian, uh, uh, British linebacker, uh, who's now playing for the Berlin Thunder. He requested his release from the Ticats. Uh, a number of other players at the practice roster le- level have done the same thing. And players who have been drafted by the CFL Global Program who have simply just refused to come and who have instead stayed in Europe. And what people need to understand is this is not an equivalent level of competition to the CFL, but there is decent money that is available right now in this sort of semi professionalized version of European football that has sprung up, especially if you are a high level player who can play in a country other than your own, like Steven Nielsen is he's Danish, but he will be playing in Austria. He'll be what they call a European import. And so he'll be highly coveted. I'm sure well compensated, but he'll also have the ability to, in the off season, work another job and make money. I've I've had European players who are very talented, guys with NCAA pedigree, who are absolutely of the level where they could come in and have an impact in the CFL, like we've seen a few of the global players have, like Diedrich Hansen. Tell me, why the hell would I come to Canada? I'm making 100,000 euros a, a year between playing football and my real job. Uh, at the time, it was $54,000 Canadian. Now that's gone up to match the minimum salary for the rest of the league, which I think is a good move by the league. But still, it's not equivalent. They can have a better situation staying at home And most importantly, they know they're not getting playtime. Now, there's been a couple of teams that have embraced the global program, none more so than the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, who I think have really empowered their global athletes and given them roles. But Steven Nielsen coming from Edmonton, everybody and their grandmother knew that Chris Jones was not going to play a global player at anything other than punter. That was it. 
signed, sealed, delivered. Now, he messed up the evaluation and he couldn't find a decent kicker to save his life. So he had to dress Nielsen as the seventh offensive lineman all year round. But this is a guy who played at Eastern Michigan, who was a conference all-star in the NCAA, who signed a contract with the Jacksonville Jaguars. He wants to play. And I don't think he saw a path to the field with the Edmonton Elks, who, by the way, cut all their non-kicker global players beside, besides Nielsen last year, a list which included Thibaut Dubai, who ended up signing with BC, played 50% of their snaps at defensive tackle, had a wonderful season that included three sacks and was a real impact player for the Lions. This was a blanket statement by the Elks that they are against this program, as many teams and many evaluators on the football operations side have been and because of that disconnect between what the league office is trying to do and what teams are willing to give these players opportunities to do Europeans do not see this as a great opportunity anymore they did the first time around with that first wave with Deandre Hansen they saw it as something new something that they could come in and maybe make a jump in the level of competition that is no longer the case it is going to be tough sledding for the CFL to get players to come and commit to this league. I still think what Randy Ambrosi said at his state of the league press conference rings so true. He admitted that the global program has not brought in any substantial revenue. And I believe the CFL, you know, against all of JC's passion here needs to focus on its homegrown talent and investing that money domestically to growing the games and grassroots programs and getting more fans into the stands. So there is a disconnect there, JC, I will admit. I'm not saying that these global players are not talented enough to play in the CFL, but I was always of the mind that they should earn it just like the Americans do that come up to our country. I don't think there should be this pathway laid out. And because there has been this shift to the global program and so many people are going with kickers and punters, that has essentially made the Canadian kicker and punter extinct, all but extinct. I mean, there's some of them, but that has gone away. So what does that do to the kickers and punters that are doing it here in Canada? I just think on so many levels, this program, nothing to do with the athletes, but the way that the CFL has gone about it has been an absolute failure. It's been a waste of money. They should invest it domestically. And if there happens to be a talented global player let's see say the league has given them that designation that thrives in the ncaa they can come into our league just the same way the americans do to me that would be a better investment of the league's dollars and also be a much more fair way to compensate the global athletes and let's also mention this nielsen was a udfa signing of the jacksonville jaguars Coming out of Eastern Michigan, he was the number two overall pick in the 2021 CFL Global Draft. Like, if anybody was going to come in at a non-kicker position, and mind you, offensive tackle is hardly sexier than kicker, but if anybody was going to come in and make an impact, it was Steven Nielsen. And he li- he was under contract for 2023. He basically threw the keys on the table and said, I'm done sitting on the bench and wasting the best years of my career on a bad team, making the equivalent of 50,000 euros a year. I can make more money and actually play in my home country. I'm gone. And if that isn't an indictment of this whole program, I don't know what is I had a league source tell me during great cup week that there are going to be less globals at this year's combine than there have been in the past. As far as I'm concerned, that number should be zero because this program should not exist. If we want to have global players, fantastic. I'm all for growing the game. I'm all for having these guys. And by the way, we talk about them as being global. A lot of them play high school football and college football in the United States. At that point, they may as well be American. The fact that they're originally from another country is somewhat irrelevant. But anyways, I, I think this program, you know, I, I've, I've always been a skeptic of this program with, with what has occurred over the last month between Randy Ambrosi's uh, address at the State of the League and between this Nielsen development. It just highlights how much of a gong show and waste of time it truly has been. And everyone knows that I am, I'm one of the 
firmest proponents left out there of the global program, just from the standpoint that I like the growth of the game. And I believe affirmative action, in a sense, is built into what the CFL is. You look at the Canadian ratio, and that is so important to to me and, and, and what it means for this country and this league. And quite frankly, I'm an advocate for extending that slightly just with a couple of spots for international athletes, because I think it's good for the game and it's just damn cool from a, from a personal standpoint. I like it, but there is not going to be revenue here, right? Everything that you guys have said has been correct. Other than the fact, Dunk, you bemoan the amount of money spent on the global program. I think that was true two years ago. There's no longer any meaningful cash being spent here other than to fly players in for the combine. The CFL in many ways has disconnected from this program and is doing it in a half-assed manner. So it cannot be effective and the players see this. So it's difficult for me, even as an advocate for this program, to A, defend it right now, and B, see a path forward for in the future, given that it seems like those within the CFL are not truly committed to it. The football operations people still do not want it and will not embrace it. And now the players that they are actively trying to attract do not really see it as a viable path forward for them. Uh, that's really unfortunate. I think it's been a failure on all all fronts from all parties. And that makes me incredibly sad as someone who wants to see people from diverse backgrounds have success in our league. Two quick things to that. One, JC, I think you have to be the biggest proponent of this movement because you are the only person who is left as a proponent <laughs> of this program. And secondly, you say the league has no expenses except for flying guys into the combine. Might I ask, where would that money otherwise be spent if we weren't bringing in guys? All right, they'd be spent on Canadian players who have played our game at either the U Sports level or the NCAA level, and we'd be supporting local domestic athletes, by the way, many of whom were born in other countries. You just have to watch a World Cup game and look at, at the faces and the names on Team Canada. And as much as those players are proudly Canadian, I'm fully proposing you don't have to be born in Canada to be Canadian. Our doors are open. I think that's wonderful. These guys are already from diverse backgrounds. The fact that they are they don't have Canadian citizenship doesn't necessarily mean a whole heck of a lot. These guys, we have, we have plenty of... David Onyemata, a perfect example. He represents not only the University of Manitoba and the province of Manitoba and his country of Canada. He also represents where he was born, right? Overseas. I believe he was Nigerian born, right? He, I mean, Enoch he's more Mwamba. than Nigerian born. He's Nigerian raised. He, he came yes. to Canada University. He's not even really Canadian by Enoch any true Mwamba, definition. Enoch reigning most outstanding player and most out, or most valuable player and most valuable Canadian in the Grey Cup. Mostly, you know, Canadian raised, but again, was born overseas, I believe, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So my point is there is diversity built into our nation. Why not support more of our Canadian athletes who already embody that diversity? But I digress. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to disagree with you, Hodge, but I will say this. I am skeptical that that money would actually go towards that and not just simply giving the presidents or the commissioners a, a little pay raise uh, at this stage. I don't know if they, they care enough about Canadian content to actually commit it to that initiative um, right now. Dunk, Argo's head coach Ryan Didwitty told you that Grey Cup hero Chad Kelly is ready to be a starting quarterback in the CFL. Do you think he'll be at the top of the depth, depth chart next season? And if so, whose depth chart? It's, it's going to be a depth chart. It's got to be Toronto. Dinwiddie clearly loves this guy. And Chad Kelly continues to say after his fourth quarter great cup performance that the price has gone up. Now, he actually does have a pretty solid contract for an American quarterback going into his second year in the CFL. I believe he can make, what is it, fellas, well over $200,000. That's if he hits all of the incentives. But even if he just plays a bunch of games and starts a bunch of games for Toronto – he can make over 200K next year. So 
I don't understand exactly what Chad Kelly is thinking. Maybe he's thinking that he's going to make like millions of dollars like the guys do down in the NFL or like his uncle Jim. Used Does to make. anyone <laughs> understand what Chad Kelly's thinking at any point in his life? I, I don't know if there's like a ability to track that. No, well, we understand what he's thinking when he's partying on the stage. But uh, other than that, I think he needs to understand the CFL salary cap and what quarterbacks make up here a little better. But it's fine. Honestly, this guy is a charismatic personality. And just in my analysis, there has to be something there with it being Chad Kelly, who was the one that brought the Grey Cup on the stage for the Argos Grey Cup celebration at Maple Leaf Square in downtown Toronto. He was the guy that carried it out when the team was introduced. Not Ryan Dinwiddie, not Larry Tannenbaum, not Bill Manning, not Pinball Clemens, not Enoch Mwamba, but Chad Kelly. Let's think about that in the grand scheme of things and what that potentially means for the future. Now, Dinwiddie did say that you know, there's champagne still to drink, but that there's going to be more in the future with Kelly. So that leads me to believe that Dinwiddie can see him, and he admitted as such, as the Argos starter in 2023. And I do think it's an ideal situation. And I'm not saying he's going to put up the type of numbers that Nathan Rourke did. But if you look at the situation with Rourke and BC, you got to learn from a veteran guy in Michael Riley. Was Riley a much better quarterback than McLeod Bethel Thompson? Yes, but Kelly had that year in 2022 to learn from McLeod Bethel Thompson, who did lead the CFL in passing and gained a whole bunch of confidence from coming in in that fourth quarter. And I felt like if Kelly didn't come into the game, I don't think Toronto would have won because he threw the ball exceptionally well. And he was able to get away from that pressure, especially on that second and long scramble that would be iconic in Argonauts history. So I think you could have a similar scenario where it's a quarterback who has learned for a year, is now comfortable in Ryan Dinwiddie's offense, is a guy that Dinwiddie loved and wanted to trade for anyways. And I could see him being the Argos starter next season. So just to recap, Chad Kelly in his CFL career, playoffs included, has attempted 52 passes. So as much as yes, Ryan did what he says that, that, that Chad Kelly could be a starter in this league, which by the way, I, I'm not sure how else he could have answered that question, right? It's not like he's going to say, Oh no, 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 no. Chad's not ready. He's got to sit for a while longer. <laughs> I am just saying, and, and I do like Chad Kelly. I talked to him several times during great cup week. I was impressed with him and I agree with you, dunk. I don't think Toronto wins that game. If Chad Kelly does not come into it late, that that 20 yard uh, scramble that he had to convert on second 15, I think is going to be one of the most iconic plays, uh, not only just of this past great cup, but probably of the last number of great cups. That's going to stand out as an iconic moment, an iconic play that that really helped secure that game for the Argonauts as they completed their fourth quarter comeback. All I'm saying is I think we're expecting a whole heck of a lot. And we talked about Dane Evans earlier this show. We've talked about Cody Fajardo. Do you want to talk about Jonathan Jennings? Do you want to talk about James Franklin? Like we are so quick as members of the media, our publication is not the only one who does it, to fawn over the next big thing. And so often the next big thing does not happen right? It does not become the next big thing. Bo Levi Mitchell was probably the last quarterback in this league to be the quote unquote next big thing and hit. And the last time I checked, that was 10 years ago, boys. He's been in this league since 2012. So do I think Chad Kelly could start for Toronto next year? Yes. However, I think they need to have a good one B option, i.e. Dane Evans or a player of that ilk to kind of be there. It could be Matthew Schultz. He'd be another very good option at a guy who plays somewhat of a similar style to Chad Kelly, right? A bit of a similar stature even. Um, So I I think this could be the answer for Toronto, but I also think it's important to maybe just pump the brakes a tiny little bit. Yes, he has NFL pedigree. He played at a major American college, but this guy has thrown 52 career passes in the CFL. Maybe, maybe. We need to keep that in mind just a little bit. That's more than yeah. JC's boy Nathan Rourke threw going into 2022. Let's just put that out there. But Nathan, if yeah, every Nathan. quarterback 
who came up <laughs> through the system was Nathan Rourke, we would have a very different CFL. I'll let JC go but, and then I'll provide my take on that. But here's the thing, right? Not every quarterback is going to hit, but if you, if I think one of the biggest differences right now, and we bemoan somewhat erroneously, but but also correctly in a way, how the quarterback play in the CFL is is maybe not as good as as we nostalgically remember it. And that's not entirely true, but I think it's correct that right now the gap between NFL quarterbacking and CFL quarterbacking has never been wider. And I think what the NFL has figured out is that if you don't have the guy, you go and find the guy. And it's okay to swing and miss on the way to finding the guy. Because if you miss, you know what you do? You just swing at another guy. And you keep doing that until you find the one who can be a top tier. To me, in the CFL, it has to be a top three quarterback in the league. Somebody who can elevate your level of talent and take you to the next level. Do we know for sure that Chad Kelly is going to be that guy for the Toronto Argonauts? No, we don't. You can never be certain of that, but we know that he has the tools right from a physical skills standpoint. There may be more, no more physically talented quarterback in the CFL right now. Now, whether he's got it between the ears or or maybe he's too much of a risk taker, that could all blow up, right? That is not the only thing that's important as a quarterback. But if you're an evaluator and you're looking at that, you have to take the shot for the good of your franchise, for pushing yourself to the next level. And specifically, if you're the Toronto Argonauts and you're just coming off a Grey Cup victory with what was admittedly an extremely veteran roster, one in which I think a number of key pieces are on the decline and probably can't get you to the next level, maybe even next year, but certainly not in the next couple of years. Well, what's the risk? Right, You've got the goodwill stored away. Now is the time to take your shot on the guy you think can be the next one. And if you fail, that's fine. Then you take another shot after. CFL teams have been far too conservative at the quarterback position for far too long. And it's about time they start getting with the program and realize that in modern day pro football, heck, in modern day college football, the, the reality is you have to take shot after shot after shot at the quarterback position until you find a top tier guy. And right now, too many teams in the CFL are happy coasting with mid tier or bottom tier quarterbacks because they are too afraid of failing when taking that shot. Excellent point, JC and Hodge. I agree with what you said in terms of there being the flip side of it, the quarterback's who don't work out. And I'm not saying Kelly's going to work out for sure, but I think that he has a lot of the traits that could make up a potential franchise guy. And he's got that name that's going to be marketable in Toronto. We've already seen it on the site. The stuff that we've written about Chad Kelly has done better than most of the other Argos content that we post. So he has that name because his uncle Jim Kelly played for the Buffalo Bills, took them to four straight Super Bowls, and is a legend just not too far away from Toronto. And there's a lot of Bills fans around here that understand that and actually know that. And that makes Chad Kelly a recognizable face. Now, that doesn't necessarily make him a high-caliber quarterback, but I think he has the skills to be able to do that. And to JC's point, I think it would be prudent for Toronto – to keep him and work through that. Yes, he's only thrown 52 passes, and Nathan Rourke is the exception to the rule in terms of being able to go from backup to the best quarterback in the league. But Kelly also has that ability, and he's at an age where NFL teams probably aren't going to look at him, and even though he might not want to hear that, and even though Kelly believes he's better than 50% of NFL starters, he's 28. So realistically, NFL teams aren't going to bring him in. And he's already had his shot down there. And some of the off-field issues caused that not to play out probably the way that Kelly would have wished. And he's already in the gym, guys. Like he's posting on social media that he's back at it. When I talked to him, I got this sense 
that he was going to do everything in his power to be ready, in shape, focused, committed for this opportunity. I think he's learned from these mistakes in the past, even though he's going to enjoy what Toronto has to offer and some of the Grey Cup spoils. I think he did that for a little bit. Now he's already back at it in the gym, preparing for that opportunity in 2023. And I asked him about the potential of Bo Levi Mitchell coming and signing with the Argos due to all the connections that he has with former St. Peter coaches on that staff, including Ryan Dinwiddie, the head coach. And he essentially doesn't care. He said, if Bo Levi Mitchell comes, that's fine. I'll deal with it. And we'll go ahead and compete. So I just think he has the right attitude. He's got the physical traits and the name could be sexy to, dare I say, potentially revive what is something that is so unsexy in Toronto, and that's the Argonauts. I hate saying it because we all love Canadian football on the site and the readers and listeners and viewers, and of course, the three guys that have been on here talking for a while now about this great game. But in Toronto, it's just not sexy. I think with Chad Kelly, there could be a little bit of star power there that could give you some oomph to get some new Argos fans into the stadium because that's ultimately what Toronto needs to do to become a successful franchise from a business perspective in the CFL. Two quick things. One, I think McLeod Bethel Thompson, if he is done and there is speculation that he could retire, and by the way, I do think that the Argos, if the choice is McLeod or Kelly, I think it's wise to roll with Kelly. I will say, and I'm planning to write an article about this, I think McLeod could be the least appreciated quarterback in CFL history. This is a guy who's led the league in passing. He's led the league in passing touchdowns and he's won a great cup as a starter. And everybody seems to think that he stinks. Like I, I can't think of another quarterback in CFL history with that resume and a lack of reputation uh, coincided with that. The other thing I will say, I forgot to mention the previous segment, three down nation did reach out to Steven Nielsen for an interview, he has not replied to that request. Last topic, JC, you wrote an opinion piece on why the inability for CFL players to sign midseason NFL contracts gives the USFL and XFL a recruitment advantage. Tell us about it. Well, this is a, a piece that sort of came out of some discussions I had with, with personnel people over Grey Cup. So I'm not the it's not coming wholesale out of my own mind. There are other people in the league who are thinking about this. And and I also want to preface this by saying, I'm not saying players should be allowed to leave the CFL midseason, right? And and jump straight from the CFL into the NFL that way, which I got a lot of comments on Twitter from people who just read the headline and not the article and seemed to believe I was advocating for that. That is not the case. We're talking about joining an NFL team mid NFL season after the CFL t- season is complete. Are you suggesting I, that some people read headlines, but not the whole article? I, 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 I'm <laughs> flabbergasted. <laughs> I, I'm shocked. But the, the, the crux of the issue here is that we have these other leagues, right? The AAF first, the XFL, the USFL, and, and then the third version, the XFL coming down the pipe. And while I think almost universally people seem to acknowledge the fact that the CFL has a better, more established game right now, that they have better talent, for some reason these other leagues are getting massively more uh, – NFL contracts at the end of their season compared to the CFL. And then the numbers really are staggering. Just to use the latest example, last season, 11 CFL players signed uh, NFL contracts. And in that 11, I'm also including uh, uh, Winnipeg's practice squad, British linebacker, who is now with the Jacksonville Jaguars as part of the NFL's uh, version of the global program. So he doesn't really count, uh, but he is included in that 11. The USFL signed 51 players to the NFL. 51. That is a staggering difference. And now the amount of players that that actually made teams is not that different, right? You're seeing CFL guys who made the jump stick on practice rosters at, at, at a very high rate. And, and D. Alford has established himself 
as a legitimate player with the Atlanta Falcons, our, our CFL all-star from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at, at cornerback last year, from the USFL group, just one player out of those 51 made an NFL active roster, and they had 13 make a practice squad. So the bulk of those players are getting cut, but how you account for this disparity between the amount of players signed from this lesser league – versus the CFL. And the reality is a big part of it is timing, right? These spring leagues, they come straight out of their season and players are allowed to jump right from that league into an NFL training camp. And NFL teams covet them because they're in shape. They need a camp body at a certain position. And rather than grabbing a guy who they're not sure whether they're going to be able to compete, they'll get a guy who's in shape, who's maybe off the scrap heap, that they know that is not going to make a roster necessarily. And they'll give them a shot to compete because they know they won't embarrass themselves. There's no equivalent for that in the CFL right now because you cannot sign in season with the NFL. All these guys who are doing workouts right now to sign in the NFL will have to sign futures contracts and they will not be able to play for eight months until training camp next year. So teams that may have a need at a position right now, you think about a team that maybe needs a receiver or wants to beef up their practice roster as they head towards the playoffs, they can't go out and sign a Dalton Schoen or bring in a Dylan Mitchell or a Malik Henry and say, okay, this guy is ready to go. Let's have him in reserve just in case we need a guy for the playoffs. They cannot do that at this stage. Those players have to wait. And so there is no incentive for NFL teams to bring in sort of the next tier of talent from the CFL. And we see this impact. And and the last thing I'll say before I'll move on, where I think this would really help the league is on NFL cutdown. Because I can remember when I first started following the CFL extremely closely, NFL cutdown day at the end of NFL training camp was viewed as a marquee day on the CFL calendar, right? You'd have that day, and all of a sudden, all these players would become available to you. You could bring them up. You could change the the face of your team if you needed to. You could have this influx of talent, expand your practice roster, and really get some some very, very good players on that date or, or just slightly afterward. That is not the case anymore, right? NFL practice rosters have expanded, which has hurt that that process as well. But more often, these players are waiting to play in one of these spring leads for a variety of reasons, right? Also staying close to home and things like that, but also because they know they're sending more players to the NFL because they can jump right from there into the NFL. And if they come to Canada, it's a little bit dicier. Imagine what impact it would have on recruiting. If you could say you were an NFL cut down player, sorry, you didn't make it come up here, play 10 games with us. Right. And then you can join an NFL team on the practice roster by the end of the season, right? You can go back to the league afterwards. Now, we still have you under contract. You're going to come back to us next year if they cut you. But here's an opportunity for you to get some game tape and then jump right back to the NFL before the USFL season even starts. I think it would be a tremendous way to cut off the USFL and XFL talent drain that is already happening as as only going to get worse and the league needs to explore a way to make that possible well said jc let's keep it moving and get to hodge's heritage moment on this day in 2016 the calgary stampeders defeated the hamilton tiger cats by a score of 20 to 16 to capture the 102nd Great Cup. The Stamps generated an early 17-0 lead on a pair of Drew Tate touchdown runs and led the game 27 in the fourth quarter. The Tie Cats got three late field goals from Justin Medlock before Brandon Banks scored a touchdown on a 90-yard punt return in the final minute of the game. The return was called back when Taylor Reed was penalized for an illegal block, foiling Hamilton's comeback attempt. Andy Fantuz would name the game's most valuable Canadian in a losing effort, recording six receptions for 81 yards. Boys, the thing I thought while writing this today, Brandon Banks, six years later, finally got his Grey Cup title just, just a couple weeks ago in Regina. 
but Good not with him. the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And you've not just created a painful moment for Tiger Cats fans <laughs> to relive yet again. So I'm sure they'll thank you for that. <laughs> it's, Let, it's a painful moment for everyone. This is a great cup. I was actually in attendance for I had no rooting interest in either team. I, I was there with my high school football team at BC Place, and we all left that stadium feeling sick to our stomachs because you had this incredible moment that was taken away by penalty. I've never had uh, an experience quite like that watching a football game, and I hope I never do again because I want big plays to stand. Sorry, quick correction. 2014. 100 second, 100 second Grey Cup is correct. This was 2014, eight years ago. I thought that sounded wrong. 2014, my apologies, not 2016. The three-minute drill, baby. Hodge, you reported the Toronto Argonauts pending free agent list. Who is the most important player for them to re-sign? There are big names on the list, but to me, the most important one is Winton McManus, who was absolutely sensational when he was healthy this year at weak side linebacker. The Argonauts celebrated their Grey Cup win at the Scotiabank Center with the Toronto Raptors. And Drake, have you ever celebrated anything with Drake, JC? I have not had that pleasure, no. I don't think I'm cool enough to be in Drake's presence. Argos head coach Ryan Dinwiddie revealed that he turned down a job with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers before ever becoming Toronto's head coach. Do you think that was the right decision, Dunk? It seems to have played out that way from a CFL perspective now that he's a great cup champion head coach, but we know the upside in the NFL in terms of the money that he could have made if he became an NFL head coach would have been much more lucrative, but we'll never know. I mean, he could still jump to the NFL at some point and maybe there's going to be some teams to take notice after this great cup victory. But I think that decision in and of itself was smart because it was quality control. It does get you in the door but I think you could jump to a bigger position now if you're Dinwiddie, having been a CFL championship head coach. The Blue Bombers have re-signed a number of key veterans, including Patrick Newfeld, Willie Jefferson, and Adam Big Hill. Which of those signings do you think is the most impactful, Mr. Hodge? I mean, I, I, I feel like I have to roll with my old line here. I, I think I'd have to say Patrick Newfeld, but honestly, it's a toss-up. Big Hill is essentially a coach on the field. And Willie Jefferson is a unicorn in this league. Canadian quarterback Christian Voyou announced on Tuesday that he plans to enter the transfer portal after two seasons at Penn State. Did that surprise you? It does not surprise me at all. This is the way of the world in college football now. Unfortunately for Vieux, very highly recruited, but he has a guy in Sean Clifford who stuck around for an extra year in front of him and then a a five-star recruit who came in just after him who has leapfrogged him on the depth chart. It's good for him to move on, find a place where he can play as a very highly recruited player himself and hopefully get an NFL shot down the line because he has that level of talent coming out of Ottawa. Ucambray Williams shared images on social media of a retirement party this week. If the Ottawa Red Blacks left tackle has played his last CFL game, how will you remember his tenure in the league? A versatile offensive lineman who probably could have played longer and, of course, won a great cup championship with the Calgary Stampeders, I believe it was, in 2018. So if he is done, we wish you, Cambrai, all the best in retirement. We thank you, as always, for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. We will be taking some time off in December, but we will be back next week for another episode of the show.